Hello, everybody, and welcome to our um, Ozabot Coding Club webinar. We are so thrilled to be um, featuring Christine and Liz, two of our certified educators who have done an incredible um, job uh, delivering robotics education to their students um, in the era of COVID and also starting a coding club with their students. Um, my name is Melissa Tui. I'm the EdTech and Adoption Specialist here at Ozobot, um, but I will be turning it over to Christina and Liz in just a couple of minutes once um, we go through some of our housekeeping items. So, um, for today's agenda, we are going to um, go over our housekeeping items, then um, Liz and uh, Christine are going to go over what an OZA team is, the OZA team sessions, um, lessons learned and successes, um, Q&A, and then we will wrap up with a giveaway. So. Um, just a couple of housekeeping keeping items. We are recording the session. Um, if you opt in for email updates with, through ozabot.com, you will get a webinar recording of this email to you. You can also find it on our YouTube page and our webinar page. Um, as a participant in the audience, you, uh, you are on mute and your camera is off, but you're welcome to join the conversation by typing in the chat. Make sure to change your um, the two field to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your messages. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature um, so that we can keep track of all of the questions and um, circle back to them at the end of the webinar. Um, with the Q&A, you can also upvote and comment on one another's questions as well. So pl please um, utilize one another's expertise and um, uh, yeah, uh, start that dialogue and um, enjoy the time here. We have Ozobot team members, Heather and Cassandra, um, in the background, moderating the chat and the Q&A. So if you have any Ozobot specific um, questions, you can pop them in there and we'll um, do our best to answer those. Great. And um, so we have, uh, we are giving away an educator entry kit. So if you go to ozo.bot slash giveaway, um, type in your name and your email address. Um, we will be picking a winner at the end of the webinar. Um, you are only, um, please enter, enter only once as um, multiple entries will be disqualified. So it's fair for all of the participants in our audience. Um, looks like Cassandra put that link in the chat. So feel free to click there as well if you want an easy way to access the giveaway. And um, Yes, please enter once and we'll close the, the giveaway in about um, 15 minutes. So at uh, about 20 minutes past the hour, we will close that giveaway. Great, again, my name is Melissa Tui. I'm a former teacher, um, but today is not about me. It's about Christine and Liz. So I'll pass it to them to introduce themselves. Go ahead, Christine. Hi everyone, my name is Christine Taipapa and I teach third grade currently mm -hmm. in a school in um, Prince William County. Bristol, Virginia. Um, Liz here is my teammate and um, I've gotten to become an Ozobot certified educator. Very excited about um, all that that's opened up for the kids and my colleagues and excited to be here to share what we did with our club. And we'll pass Hi. it to Liz. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Liz Anderson. I am a third grade teacher with Christine Taipapa at uh, Christian Elementary School in Prince William County Schools. And I'm excited to be here and share uh, information about our club today. Perfect. We're going to jump into some poll questions just to get an idea of who is in the audience. Um, we'd love to know everyone's familiarity with Ozabot. We'll give everyone about 30 seconds to answer the poll question. Um, everywhere um, from I'm brand new to Ozabot or I currently own and use Ozabot in the classroom. So go ahead and feel free to enter that poll question. We have about 10 seconds left. Great. It looks like most of us are familiar um, with Ozobot, but some of us are um, less familiar. But I think um, both Christine and Liz have some really great content so that no matter what your famili familiarity level is, um, you'll have content to be able to access and to implement. Um, our next question, we'd love to know what grades everybody teaches. So we'll give everyone about 30 seconds to fill out that poll question. Oh, 
All right. It looks like we are in that third through eighth grade realm or kindergarten through eighth grade. So that's wonderful. And then we have one more question. Um, what subjects are you most interested in teaching? <laughs> yes, Nikki, K to five. That is, yes, <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> All right, and it looks like we're all along the STEM, STEAM spectrum, um, but a lot of technology, so that's really exciting to see. Um, thank you all for your participation in those poll questions. It helps us get an idea of who is in um, the audience. So with that, um, Christine or Liz, would one of you like to take over the screen so that you're able to control the slides? Great, I'll stop sharing and I'll pass it over to you all. <clears throat> Hi everyone. So we wanted to start with talking about why we ended up doing a virtual coding club. <clears throat> well, it started with, there was actually a solid group of us at our school that is Ozobot, we're Ozobot certified educators. And the idea originated from one of our colleagues. And so as a group, we were talking about it and um, how much we thought the kids could benefit from it, you know, because we were Ozobot certified educators and our school has a STEAM focus. So coding and engineering um, that is embedded in our, what we do from kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, but we had access to these awesome Ozobots and we wanted to go ahead and share that out. Uh, you know, they're just sitting in the building or in our homes untapped. So during this time when everything was so digital, you know, everything's on the computer, we thought this would be a great opportunity to give them some hands-on experience with the Yozobots. And, um, we, you know, one thing that we talked about that we thought was really important was just that additional opportunity that it would allow the students to interact with each other and with us without that academic expectation. Um, and so that definitely came to fruition, just that, uh, that chance to talk things through in a more social setting. And of course, we had really great support from our administrators and other colleagues. Okay, so what is the Ozobot Club? Uh, we decided to call it the Ozo Team. Um, originally, we sent out a survey in Microsoft Forums and we had the kids answer some questions. Um, we were, we had a set amount of Ozobots we were willing to use and luckily we had enough kids sign up that we had about 13 um, in our club, uh, which was a good number. Uh, we ended up meeting weekly on via Zoom, we set up everything through Canvas. Our schedule this year, when we first started, was 100% virtual, and we actually have a asynchronous Monday um, learning day. So Mondays was no live Zoom for students or teachers uh, for instruction. So that's when we held our club, and it was a good time for the kids to meet with us. Um, and again, like uh, Christine was saying, in that non-academic setting. Um, so we used Zoom to meet with them. We set everything up through Canvas, which they were already familiar with. We were already using it for a few months at that point. Um, we use Class Dojo for communication. Our school, I love it. They, we are just all about Dojo. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out, um, it just seamlessly seemed to work out really well um, that we were able to send information that way. And originally we set up to meet on Mondays, six sessions. Uh, we would start with attendance. We'd have a little lesson to introduce what we were doing that day. And then we would review the expectations for next week and have a closing time for questions and answers. And usually we would run about the whole 45 minutes to an hour for our sessions. So and I just wanted to um, also say that <clears throat> Liz mentioned the size of our club. We were pretty purposeful about not wanting it to be too large. Um, so about the 13, 14 range was, was really reasonable for us. It wasn't, it was the Ozo bots that we had available, but that was a factor. But the other factor was between the two of us, we wanted to make sure that we could really address the needs of all the kids in the club, you know, um, especially virtually. It was, 
it, we, we didn't want to overload and then have kids who were so frustrated that we couldn't address their needs. So that was a huge factor also into the size of our club. Um, so that was part of it. <laughs> And I think even if when we next year, uh, when we plan to go forward with this, I still think that's a good number to be in person as well, not just like a good virtual number. Um, so this is an example of our, this is a photo of our Canvas page that we had set up. So students um, already had access to Canvas, like we said, for all their other subjects. So we added it as a class uh, course, excuse me, in Canvas. And they were able to link right into our Zoom from there. They could see the schedule, what was coming up, and we had to send them messages or vice versa. We put our assignments in there for them um, to submit. We also worked with Flipgrid for them to show their final projects. So that was a good um, fit since it, it works right in with Canvas. Um, so everything that they needed would be in like one-stop shopping here. And it seemed to work out pretty well. They seemed to, and the, in third grade, they were pretty well versed on how to use this technology, which is great too. Um, okay, so the first two sessions we did was actually no bots, no bots then. So the first two sessions, which is before the bots, we really wanted to stress with them, what is coding? Why is it important? Um, and one of the things that we talked about was being being future ready and what kind of jobs you can get in the future that involve coding and also what kind of jobs you can have right now that involve coding. Um, there's a really great video from Amazon that shows how they use robots to do their work. And um, that was something really interesting to be able to show them was how robots are doing work right now. And we were kind of trying to relate that with the Ozobot. Um, so our first unplugged activity is the one that you can see here. Oh, and the certificate of acceptance. So after they submitted their application to the club, we sent them a little certificate of acceptance and made it a really big deal like they got accepted. So I think that was pretty neat that they got to have that. Um, but this first unplugged activity is one that Christine came up with and the students had to get from the gingerbread house to, oh, sorry, from the gingerbread person to the gingerbread house. And they had to, to do it in steps using the codes um, that are in the chart attached to there. So they had a really good time with that. And this, you know, we're, we're virtual, but I think this would easily be a really good in-person one as well. Um, so we did this unplugged activity and let them work on that. That was a good time. We spoke with them about what is Ozotown um, and that's block coding with their algorithm that's online. Um, through the Ozobot website. And our students being part of a STEAM school, they already had a lot of experience with code.org. So that um, block coding was already familiar to a lot of them. Um, but some of them, you know, being new, didn't have that experience. So it didn't really matter what level of experience they had, whether they're really familiar with uh, coding or block coding or brand new to it. Um, they were all able to learn and uh, share with each other. So that was really nice to see. Um, so one thing I just wanted to add on was part of the reason we wanted to start with the unplugged activity was because we wanted to make sure that if there were kids that came in with absolutely zero experience, that they could get their minds started with thinking in terms of how code works, you know, how things have to work step by step, how they have to think everything through, you know, even those turns, you know, and I feel like that's something that a lot of kids struggle with is that idea of that turning and moving forward. Um, they kind of assume it does two steps in one. So we just thought that this would be a good way to get them started in a very like simple, familiar type setting. And we definitely had a lot of laughs going through this because if they gave us the wrong code, we would, you know, we would do whatever they said on the board or on the screen, we would share a screen. And, um, you know, there was a lot of, oh, wait, no, 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 I meant this or I meant that. So um, that was that we thought that was a really good way just to get them started. And, you know, Liz, one thing I realized we didn't really talk about was the group, the age group that we decided on with the third graders. Do you want to talk about that or? 
Yes, so we decided um, being third grade teachers, we already had a lot of access to third graders, but we decided to use third graders, not just because they were our kids, but um, there's also a lot of opportunities for the upperclassmen um, that are only available to them. So I think um, making this available to the third graders was something nice and special just for them and to kind of get them thinking about the things that they could be working on later on through the robotics clubs and the other things that are going on at our school. So it was nice that this was an opportunity just for the third graders. I don't know if you had something to add on that. No, that was it. Um, so we made this pretty legit. We have a um, release form. So when the kids had to come pick it up, because again, totally virtual. I've there's kids in my class I still haven't really like met face to face yet, but we had the kids come in with their parent or guardian um, and come pick up the bot. We had a bot kit for them ready to go and a packet of papers that we were planning on using for the rest of our club. Um, the bot kit was a little container from the dollar store and it was numbered with a number that was on the bot. We gave them a small USB charger. Um, it, the bot also had that, that silicone cover on it, the protection one. Um, we gave them one black marker, papers um, that we're gonna be using in the up and coming lessons. Um, we had them sign the release form and we let them know that this is a very special um, piece of machinery and you're gonna be in charge of it. You're gonna be in charge of charging it. Um, and if anything should happen to it, you you will have to replace it or um, supply the money to replace it. So we took it very seriously. And I think that also helps with responsibility for them too, is to be able to take care of something like this. Um, so the parents came in, signed with their kids and we re released them with their little kit. And that seemed to work out pretty well. Um, and we didn't lose any and they all came back in good working condition. We almost lost one, but um, he went and found it. He, he knew what the consequences were if he didn't come back with it. We did almost lose one. And I remember he, he reached out to us. He said, I can't find my Ozobot. And we said, well, you knew when you signed up for the club because we really wanted to emphasize, you know, then that's your responsibility to replace it. And there was no, you know, questioning about it. They understood that they had signed it. And we, we really emphasized when they came to pick it up that we would only release it if they brought an adult with them, like a guardian, to sign the form as well so that um, the parents were fully on board with that because our Ozobots are pretty precious. <laughs> and so if we were going to trust them and lend them out, we wanted to make sure they came back. But thankfully, he found the Ozobot and it worked out. Um, so the first bot lesson that we had was doing bot camp. And if you don't know what this is, um, it comes with your certified educator kit. Um, and also you can print it off online. So we printed out the PDF from online um, in color. And what it does is it goes through step-by-step step how to use your bot, what it can do, um, the, the color coding with the um, lights and everything. So we went through step-by-step step with them and we did have some students that actually had a lot of experience using these in STEAM since kindergarten or um, we had students that had never used them before. And I think one had actually already had one at, at their house, and, but just going through step-by-step step with them, I think the, even the most advanced Ozobot user was able to get some information out of it. Um, and that went off pretty well. We split into breakout rooms into smaller groups and we went through the directions with them and they got to show us that they could see what was working via Zoom or what wasn't working. Um, we were able to troubleshoot with them and go through the pages with them. Um, we didn't get through all the steps on Zoom in our hour long session. So they got to complete some of it on their own and they were really excited to tell us at the next lesson or some of our kids are in our classes, um, what their progress was on that. So that was good to see and good to hear about. Um, but they ended up completing it independently. Uh, we weren't able to finish that. But it was good. So we were able to like help them. Some of the kids didn't realize like what the color block, the color codes would do or that could change lights. So it was really good um, introduction for them to learn the um, abilities and limitations of the box. I also thought it was important because um, when you are using the color codes, the, the sizing of the lines is so important. 
And so just for them to see that if it was too narrow or if it was too thick, you know, those types of things really mattered. Um, so if you haven't gone through bot camp or if you have, it, that's an amazing resource that we use with our kids and they got a lot out of it. Um, and then it ends with, you know, the beginning introduction of kind of how Ozo Blockly works. And I think for even our friend who had one at home, she had an Ozobot bit at home and we were using Evos. So like Liz said, it was still an opportunity for them to learn new things. And we, we heard some stories back from some of our uh, teammates because they were their students as well. And um, the students went back to their classrooms and you know showed off their bot camp booklets and so that was fun to hear that they were taking it from the club and bringing it back in that way so i just got a question it was uh did we give the students any tips for taking care or keeping track of the bots yes so we talked to them um, about keeping them away from liquids and food um, we also talked to them about charging them and that would be an issue for a couple of kids now and then that they wouldn't have um, their bot ready to go. And it was unfortunate when we started um, the lesson that they weren't ready or they weren't able to use it. So it was a little bit of a lesson responsibility for a few of them, but we did remind them that we want them to take care of them. They should keep them in the box when they're not using it, make sure it is charged, um, especially when we're going to be going to our classes so this way, everybody's ready to go. So those were some tips that we have. Um, but even with the greatest reminders, there's always one or two that didn't have their bot um, charged. They, they did it all, keep their supplies. We didn't have any issues with them losing um, the papers or anything that I can think about. But um, that was a really good question. Thanks, Ted. Hope that helped. So by session four, um, now that the kids had had some experience with just uh, moving through how coding works, how it was step by step and understanding that and then allowing them to have that time to familiarize themselves with how Ozobots work. Um, <clears throat> but in session four, we went ahead and jumped into Ozo Blockly. And I part of our decision to do that was also because we knew that the kids that we were working with were familiar on some level with code.org or with block coding. And I think that if we were in a school where that wasn't as common and familiar for the kids, then we would have probably spent more time with some unplugged activities or spent another week or two with color coding and line drawing just so that they were more comfortable with Ozo Blockly or with the Ozo bot in general. And then, um, you know, like Liz mentioned before, we used Ozotown, which is another really fun resource that Ozobot offers. And um, that allows them to get their Ozobot through different challenges. And that was a really good way to familiarize them with the coding piece of um, Ozo Blockly. So when we introduced Ozo Blockly, um, <clears throat> there's five different levels that you can work within Ozo Blockly and we chose to keep our kids at level two. Uh, and in under level two, they have these five different options. They can code movement, code light effects, timing, loops, and sounds. And so we thought that this was an appropriate level for them, um, not too advanced. They could wrap their minds around each of those different um, options. And it was challenging enough, there were enough options that it kept them engaged because again, we had kids that were familiar with it. So we went through and this is, these are clips from the PowerPoint that we put together. Um, and we explained, so these little uh, clips here, are these little, they're directly from Ozo Blockly. If you look in Ozo Blockly under glossary, it explains all the little movements and it gives examples and it, um, so the images I took right from there because I thought they were 
uh, very helpful. And we also showed the kids, you know, if you forget, you can always go back to this glossary button within Ozo Blockly. And so I, we will say like Ozobot just provided a lot of these great resources for us to use. So I went in and I snipped all these little images and put it in the PowerPoint and we slowly explained what each one was and, you know, made sure if they had any questions, they had the opportunity to ask and we could um, go through all of that with them. But just these five options was plenty and it took quite a long time even to go through these different ones and to explain it to them. So once we got through that, um, this was an example that Ozobot already had up. So we went ahead and we pulled it up and there are two different ways to connect an Ozobot to Ozoblockly. One is through the Bluetooth feature and another one is through this flashing of lights and it's on the screen, it flashes and it loads the bot with the programming. So we pulled that up on our shared screen and we flashed the code and the kids, we showed the kids like, hold your little Ozobot up this way and um, against the screen. And we let them load their Ozobot with the flashing option. And then that way, even though we were not with them, they could load their Ozobot and watch it move on the desktop or tabletop, wherever they were. Um, so, that was the that was how we went through the victory lap example. And so it was fun because we could talk through the different steps that they did and then they could actually see how it moved the Ozobot in their house. So once we went through all of that, um, we gave them an assignment. And so usually at the end of every club meeting, we would give them something to do for the week between our meetings. So we asked them to make a boxy bee. That's what we called it. Um, <clears throat> and they would have to use mode to the level two or higher. Um, and then to get the Ozobot to make a boxy lowercase b. And the Ozobot would have to shine the lightest blue at each corner. So programming the Ozobot to flash a light at each corner. And then when it was complete, that it would spin with the disco light feature. And I, I will say that the kids, the different light features were definitely a huge hit for our kids. So I, I'm glad that we included the light effects um, because they were very excited to use those. So like Liz said also, we use Flipgrid a lot during our, um, our club and it was the way the kids could show off their programs because our club meetings were about an hour each, it was never enough time for them to actually program during the club meeting and show it off. Um, it was enough time to sometimes get them started and then we'd have to release them and let them do it on their own. and then they would show us using Flipgrid. Whoops. So, <clears throat> so that's just like an image of what our Flipgrid looked like and they would go in and play their program. So session five was explaining their final project. So this was a lesson that um, I came up with and it's also available available on the Ozobots lessons page in the Ozobot classroom. And um, what we did was I just explained the criteria, you know, they had to draw a floor plan of a classroom, including three different obstacles. Um, and then the, there would also be a fourth thing, which would be Ozobot's desk. So Ozobot would start at the door and have to follow a path where it walked around or moved around the obstacles and ended up at their desk. Um, so once we explained that, then, you know, that of course there were lots of questions, but uh, we had to take them step by step and explain, well, each box on this grid is worth two steps in Ozo Blockly. So once they understood that, you know, um, we did this example together 
And <clears throat> I drew that line there and I numbered all those spots just so then they, you know, as we were talking, then they could explain and understand how they would count their steps by twos for each box. And then if right here, the little R would indicate the right turn. And so um, as we went through all of this um, together as a club, then they could see how it worked. And what I, we really stress the importance of not just making the map and, but also making the map and then making a plan based on the map to transfer what they wrote down on paper to what was um, electronic on Ozo Blockly. Um, once we did that, we took the kids right into Ozo Blockly and they helped us input each block code into um, the program and you know, demonstrating and how we look at the map, put it in, make sure it matches. And we would, we ran the program with the Ozobot just to see if it worked. <clears throat> so once we did all that, we, we, you know, we let the kids go on their own. And again, that took about an hour just to go through the assignment, the expectations and to model it for them. And we asked them again to use Flipgrid to record their program. And just to clarify, these lessons are in the lesson library as well. So if you're looking for these resources and you want to implement them yourself, um, our lesson library has them so that you can easily implement without having to recreate all the materials. So thank you, Christine, for submitting those. <laughs> yes, yes, they're, they're available for you to use. Um, so that was session five, and then we moved into session six. And so session six was kind of, that was our last meeting. It was a sharing out and celebration. Um, and again, going into it, the kids were to have already recorded using Flipgrid their, their program. And we really liked it because it was, it was really obvious that they were really proud of what they had done um, and proud during the Zoom meeting, proud during the Flipgrid videos. And what was really fun was it allows the club members to celebrate their success even outside of the meeting. So I, I, we just took a little picture here and you can see how in Flipgrid, if you're not familiar with Flipgrid, um, you can like each other's video submissions and you can comment on them. So that was a fun way just for for them to like interact with each other, even outside of our club meetings. And um, <clears throat> as we would share each video, we would, you know, we would cheer for them and celebrate them, but then um, they, they would have questions for each other. And here was an example that we just wanted to share with everyone. Hello, my name is Kaden. And I made a classroom map. I put a student in his desk right here a bookshelf and a student in Elizabeth's desk. We'll see how this works. And he made it. I hope you like it. Bye. So it was really neat just to see how, you know, he made something outside of the program and you can see his Ozo Blackley up behind him there and he had a successful run. Hello. <clears throat> okay, and so um, at the end of our club, you know, Liz and I talked about what were some successes that we felt like we had and some lessons that we've learned. Um, and also, if you were wondering what that kit looked like, here's a picture of the little container that we had just gotten from, we got like four for a dollar from the dollar store. And it was like the, per it was the perfect size to house our Ozobot and um, the little USB charging cord. So, and we labeled everything with numbers. So there's an example of one. Um, so successes. The students got the chance to work with Ozobots during all the virtual craziness. Um, the students asked for more club meetings. 
So uh, they were obviously enjoying it and asking to meet more often and extend the club. Um, the students that were not in the club asked about another full session of the club. So that's always really fun that the kids out, especially in this virtual setting, but they were talking to each other and kids that were that not in our, our club asked if we were hosting a second session. Um, and then some students ended up buying their own Ozobots from, you know, participating in the club. And so that was really, that was really exciting that they were that enthusiastic about it because of the time that we spent together. Um, some lessons that we learned. Please remind your students to always charge their Ozobot. Um, so <clears throat> that's, you know, the Ozobots luckily don't take too long to kind of boot up but there were definitely meetings where we had to tell the kids to go plug it in and um, they weren't charged to, for the meeting. And uh, attendance was irregular at times. Monday being an asynchronous day also meant that the students weren't necessarily in the mode of logging into Zoom. So that impacted our attendance throughout the club meetings. Um, and then one thing for sure that Ozo Blockly session could easily, we pushed it into one session, but it was easily a two to three or four session topic. So definitely you could extend the time of your club. Um, we chose six weeks, but we definitely, I think in the future we'll have at least an eight week club uh, run because that Ozo Blockly piece was it was a little challenging trying to put it in just one meeting. Um, and then the flashing code on Ozo Blockly was not as consistent as the Bluetooth connection. So, so for some of our students that were able to download that Evo app and use that Bluetooth connection, their um, Ozo Blockly coding was, was more easily transferred to the actual bot. Whereas the um, flashing with the uploading proved to be a little more challenging for them. And so th that was definitely a lesson that we learned and they would, they would have to just be patient and try again. And then there was also sometimes where calibrating the Ozobot right before loading it proved to be a lot more helpful too. Liz, did you want to add anything to that? Um, there was one time that we had a snow day and um, even though it's asynchronous, like kids actually don't have to come that day. So we gave them a bonus um, snow day challenge where I, I, with the boss that I have at home, I drew a snowman and had the, um, it was a bot follow that path. So we, even on like a snow day, we we're kind of able to modify our lesson for that um, because they didn't need to meet with us that day. They're not supposed to, technically there's no school. Um, but we did have one student who made a snowman and he had the Ozobot follow the path on it and he uploaded it via Flipgrid. So um, I think just also being adaptable is something um, to know going into this. Um, and then it ended up working out really well even though it was a snow asynchronous day. It says so much that a student on a snow day is choosing to engage with Ozobot, talk to their teachers, wanting, just wanting more. I mean, it just, that speaks volumes about how engaged they are and how authentic the challenges um, you're providing to them and how meaningful they are to your students. It, that's just so wonderful to hear. Um, mm -hmm. So congrats to you both for just pulling off such a wonderful, wonderful um, opportunity for your students, even though the challenges are immense during this time. Um, let's see, are there any Q&A questions? Um, Ted would like to know if you plan on continuing the club when you're in person again. Yes, <laughs> Liz and I have talked about it quite a bit and we think that um, <clears throat> Uh, this was a great way to engage them virtually, but we are very excited about how we could do this in person. You know, just being there is always different than having to do it through a screen. So we're excited about continuing next year. And do you, do you have any thoughts around what the differences might be in when you're in person and how the structure of the club might look different? Um, 
in person versus virtually. I'm really excited for them to be able to collaborate with each other. Um, one of the reasons that I was really excited about a club, like any club that I, I've done in the past is that I like when the kids get to actually interact with each other and learn, make friends they normally wouldn't make. So I'm excited to see like if we were to do bot camp next year, they can do little breakout groups and work together on that and help each other. Um, they definitely do learn a lot from each other more sometimes than us um, in these kind of situations. So I think that'll be really good to look forward to is seeing um, them working together to solve their own problems. Um, like I had a student who was really stuck on trying to get his Ozobot to read the code on the screen when he was holding it up. And he was like messaging me on Dojo on different days saying like, I tried this, it didn't work, but I tried that and it didn't work or I tried this and he finally got it. And he was so excited and so proud of himself. And I think that also is really important too for that drive that like, I have a problem, I'm going to solve it. I'm a problem solver. I'm going to work my way through things. I'm not going to give up. Like, I think that's also um, really nice to see and really important life lessons too. So that was something exciting out of that. So just them like having a challenge and a problem and trying to solve it is really great. I think that'll be good to put in for next year too, is um, different challenges um, and see how those work out. Great, thank you. Um, Natalie has a question. Other than making the club longer than eight weeks, are there any other changes that you would make? Um, I think that depends on <clears throat> virtual versus in person. I think virtually, yes, we would we would make it longer because definitely that Ozo Blockly piece needs a lot more attention and time, um, and just patients. But I think if we were to do it in person, I, again, like Liz was saying, I think there'd be hopefully just more collaboration and learning from each other. I, um, one thing I'm really excited about is the opportunity to walk around and give them more time to actually do things with during the club and see what they're doing and give them more of that live feedback because, well, like for example, um, bot camp, that was all on paper and it wasn't something that they could easily share with us. I mean, they would hold it up sometimes, but it wasn't all of them. So I think that's just one thing I really miss is just being able to give them that immediate feedback and walk and work in more of the small groups. Cause even though we did breakout rooms between the two of us, we still had between five to seven kids. And so I think that that's one thing that I would wanna do differently. Great, thank you. Uh, Liz, do you have any thoughts about what you might do differently? I think we kind of talked a, a little bit earlier today and she's covered a lot of the things. Um, you know, it, it'll look a little bit different in person. I think the lessons that we did, we definitely can bring with us to be in person um, as well as being a virtual lesson, um, but really like getting them to work together and um, work towards common goals. I think that'll be something really exciting to see in person next year. Wonderful. Um, Michelle has a question. How much experience would you need to start a club? How much experience would you need with Ozobots um, to start a club? <laughs> uh, I would say still a pretty decent, I don't know how to quantify that in like time, but you should at least understand how Ozo Blockly works. So understand that um, <clears throat> the different ways for Ozo Blockly to work, understanding the um, block coding and also understanding how Ozobots connect and communicate with different types of um, technology, you know, like an iPad versus a computer, it was different. And um, I, Liz and I did a little bit of learning on the way, but I would say for sure that, you know, I wouldn't quantify it in terms of time, but just in terms of, how much you've dug into what the Ozobot can do. Cause it can do so many things and that's what's really neat about it. And it's so versatile. And I love the way it builds, you know, you can start with the color coding, the bot camp, the lines, and then it feeds into the actual using of a program to put block codes together and communicate with the robot. So I don't know if that answers your question, Michelle. Or Liz, did you want to add to that? No, I think that sounds right. I think definitely understanding how the block coding works uh, was important. I know um, 
uh, actually this com comes to this question um, from Natalie. Are you the only teachers at your school who use Ozobots? Um, no, definitely not. I feel like our school is um, really um, Ozobot um, excited. Um, our, we have a STEAM teacher in our rotation so they can go to STEAM lab there. Um, last year when we were in person, um, when, Two of the, I think Christine, you have a group of them, and then um, one of the other teachers on our team had a set of them, and we would rotate them through the grade level. And I think there's a couple other teachers um, that have a handful here or there throughout the building and different grade levels, and we use them um, quite a bit for our lessons, not just for um, doing engineering or things with. Um, technology just to, for technology pieces but like I've, I've used them in social studies we use them in math we use them in language arts so um they the kids um mostly probably had some experience at some point if they were um in one of those classes or had gone to steam but if they were new to our school they may not have had any experience with them um but yeah we really love ozabots at our school <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, just to add to that, so like Liz said, we have our STEAM coach and we also have our technology coach, um, both of, and those were the two um, other colleagues of ours that are also certified educators. And so the passion and the Ozobot fever is very real in our building. Um, and so it's across the grade levels and it's, it's definitely continuing to grow this school year. Yeah, they definitely pushed me to become a certified educator um, at the beginning of the pandemic last year. And I've just had a lot of fun learning and growing um, since then. I'd had some experience with them in person before, but um, really it was really good for me to, to get a lot of experience and um, listen to my coworkers and with their experience and get help from them. So um, it, it was time well used. <laughs> Great, thank you both so much. Um, I do want to just jump back really quickly to Michelle's question about um, how much experience is needed to start the, the coding club. We do have um, a lot of video content that we're releasing with our Learn Anywhere lesson series. So if you're a teacher that's a little bit more hesitant to implement um, computer science or you're just a little bit more nervous because let's be honest, this is not content that we necessarily learned as students. Um, so it can be really daunting thinking about delivering that um, content and delivering the academic piece of it. And um, we highly recommend that you check out those videos because that might give you a way to leverage um, the instructional content in the video, but also facilitate a coding club if you're feeling a little bit ner nervous about delivering that um, academic piece of the content. Um, right now in our lesson library, there are color, codes, color code lessons um, with video content. Um, and we will be releasing Oza Blockly video content very soon here. So, and those lessons have everything um, from all the worksheets that you need to your lesson plans that you need to the videos and it's all completely free. So if you're interested, but you're not sure, um, feel free to try those out in your classroom to see how it goes. And then um, think about how you could potentially extend that to the coding club. That might be a, a really, really easy way to start. Great. All right. There was there... something I wanted to add. Alyssa. Oh, yeah, of course. Yes. Um, Liz and I talked about it, and I don't think we've mentioned it here. Uh, so there was there are two of us, and we really felt like at a minimum, you would want a co-sponsor. You would want at least two um, teachers involved in this because there were definitely times, even in the virtual setting, or maybe especially in the virtual setting, um, where it was, okay, you know, we, one of us needs to go in the breakout room and help with like these two kids or, you know, and it was, it would have been much more challenging and I think a much higher level of frustration for our kids if it had just been one of us. So very, very much like if this is something you're considering to do that you would want at least a co-sponsor with you. Do you think it's an opportunity to engage parents as well, like parent volunteers? Um, is that an opportunity to, to just have those extra hands on deck um, to send into breakout rooms? If I know that can be tricky because if the, if the parent is not, um, you know, tech savvy or is not, you know, familiar with coding, it can be more challenging than helpful sometimes, but um, <laughs> there's, there could, could be a potential opportunity there. Have you all considered that or just wanted to do it yourselves the first time around? I think for this time, we, um, 
you know, we had so many great resources amongst our colleagues and there is a level of familiarity that you would need with the Ozobot. So uh, we always welcome parent volunteers, but I think perhaps at least for this year that that would not, that might have been a little tricky just because if their questions were involving, you know, the Ozobot itself or the Oz Ozo Blackley program, um, that might have been difficult for a parent to field that type of question. Right. But classroom helpers are great. So, you know, in the future, if we were in person, that might be something um, I wouldn't turn down extra help, but I definitely would want to have at least another um, person who's really familiar with Ozobot. So like a co-host, like she said, uh, or, um, would, pr would probably be ideal, I think. Great. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. Um, I think those were all the questions in Q&A. Um, Cassandra, do you know if there were any in the chat that we have not answered yet? I don't think so, but definitely if anyone comes up with any questions after this, feel free to reach out to us by email um, or on Twitter and we'll be happy to answer. Great, perfect. Um, so we'll, with that, we'll go ahead and move on to our giveaway. Um, I, we have taken your email um, and your information and put them into a Google spreadsheet. So I'm going to ask um, Christine to pick a random number one, uh, one through 14. I'm sorry, one through 15. Um, seven. And then Liz, I'm gonna ask you to pick a number and then add seven to it. <laughs> Pick a number and I'll, um, and add seven to it. Yeah, one one through fifteen. One through fifteen. Um, so nine. Oh wait, I counted wrong. <laughs> three. <laughs> so three. Yeah. So that and puts us at ten. Yeah. Ten. Great. All right, we have um, Nikki Jones as our winner. Congratulations, Nikki. Yay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, if you are looking for your PD certificate for today's session, please email um, support at ozabot.com to get your PD certificate. Um, again, this recording will be up on our webinar page and our YouTube page, or you can opt in for updates and check out our lesson library for our latest lessons and for the lessons that um, Christine and Liz shared today. We wanna thank Christine and Liz. We know times are tough for teachers. It's not easy, but you have really, really focused on giving your students opportunities that they may not have necessarily had if they did not have this coding club. And again, that child decided to forgo his snow day to participate with Ozobot and to learn how to code. And that just speaks volumes. Um, so we really appreciate you both taking the time um, to share all of your knowledge with us. Um, we hope everyone out there stays safe and healthy. And I think the last thing I'll say is Nikki, if you can email Cassandra at ozobot.com um, to claim your prize, we will get that um, out to you. Um, but thank you again, Liz and Christine. This was wonderful and we really appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Bye.